disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Scientific breakthroughs are happening at an unprecedented rate in our modern era. Still, what are the chances that new remarkable breakthroughs have led to a miracle cure for arthritis by taking a supplement? Or a cosmetic mask that makes wrinkles vanish overnight? Or a cream that melts away the unsightly flab? Or a pill that extends your love-making pleasure? Well, with the exception of perhaps the last one, the state of marketing is exactly the same as it was 100 years ago when such marketable claims became popular. Still, marketing and science press forward with their separate agendas. In the last 100 years, a billion galaxies are discovered, tens of thousands of real cures, DNA is found in every living cell, the atom is discovered, the inner workings of the atom are unveiled, and though physics, and through physics, much mystery of the universe revealed uh, with still more mysteries found waiting ahead. Yet the claims of marketers today has changed very little from that of marketers 100 years ago. While the following hour programming will not claim to burn calories, give you tight glutes, remove crow's feet, or make removing lipstick stains from collars any more or any less painless of an endeavor, if such discoveries do happen to become reality, you will hear about it here first, long before the marketing teams have brought airtime to your ears on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Hey, Justin. Hello, Allie. Welcome, everyone, to This Week in Science. It's another week. Woo yeah, woohoo. It's another week. There's a lot more science, and we are here to run through it with our usual aplomb. Absolutely. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, aplomb. It's a good you have a usual aplomb. <laughs> exactly. I'm trying out new vocabulary today. You got to work it up always. So, on today's show. We have tons of science news, as usual. We've always got a little bit. I brought a few stories about infectious prions, eater, and the happy news of this week in the end of the world. You know, it's happy. What do you have for us, Justin? I am looking for it right now. <laughs> what did I what bring? I have. Uh. I've forgotten already. Uh, let's see. I have <coughs> a, a cold, a cough. A little bit. Something. I have scientists sniffing out an ancient ass. Neurosurgery uh, discovering the brain of God. And I have a how to cook for a fungi, as well as uh, if any of this is giving you a headache or if my coughing causes you pain, uh, I have a suggestion that you go eat some sea snails. Call me in the morning. Uh, I don't know about that. I'll have to wait for that story. Ali, what did you bring? <laughs> Allie, Allie has been absolutely <laughs> frozen in terror. She's so was afraid. It, was it something that I said? Perhaps. I am afraid. No. It was a very nice picture, though. The still image was nice. She looked very p pensive, contemplative. She didn't get stuck in one of those <laughs> like, awkward moments between expressions. No, which is always what happens with me. It's Transitional like, uh, phase expression. It always, it's when they snap the photo and you're stuck with that. Forever. Forever. Where'd she go? Oh, she's gone, but she'll come back. I was going to find out what she got on the show. Uh, I can tell you. I know what she has. <laughs> I'm going to give her a second. But ooh, she's got uh, whether or she's not really gone. Yeah. optimistic or pessimistic. Yes, and she was gonna re uh, report on uh, remembering to forget things, daydreaming, <laughs> daydreams. Maybe daydreams. that's what she's doing. Maybe she's not frozen in terror. From <laughs> she's something just like that, but... daydreaming. We lost her attention. That's all. What'd you bring, Kiki? I told you. <laughs> oh yeah. What did you say? I wasn't paying attention. 
I didn't course, hear you. Of Are you course, serious? Of course not. Infectious, I don't think you said what you're... Oh, infectious yeah. Infectious prions, eater, this week in the end of the world. I have some bits and bobs, and I have some... This week in world robot domination. What's the Zadonk thing? There's something listed here. You Zadonk. have a song that, that's yes. Zadonk. Zadonk. That's at the end of that. That's coming up. That'll, that'll be at the end. Zadonk. It's a story that was sent to me by uh, Gordon McLeod. Hmm. Zadonk. Yes. I kind of like the Zadonk. It's, it's a Zadonk. Zadonky donk. What is a Zadonk? Zadonky donk. <gasps> is she not frozen? She's gone. She's history. Oh, I see her. Hi. Am I back? You're back. <laughs> all right. We can start. We can start. I'll ask. I'll, I'll say, Allie, what do you have? And then uh, you can just take it away. Yay. Allie, what do you have? I have a story about how daydreaming affects your memory and optimistic pigs. <laughs> I've always wanted to know whether or not pigs were optimistic or pessimistic, whether they're like Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte's Web. I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious about that one. But before we get into pigs and optimism, let's take a look at some of the other science news. Uh, this week, David Eckerd brought this story to my attention. Eater, which is otherwise known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is a... Um, a nuclear fusion reactor that is slated to be built in France in a place known as Cadarache in southern France, au sud de France. And it's supposed to create fusion. So take atoms and smash their nuclei together and fuse them together. The idea hopefully being that in creating fusion, they will get more energy out than the energy that is put in. Now, uh, here in the United States, we recently uh, finished building the National Ignition Facility over in Livermore, Livermore National Labs. They, uh, this year, started up experiments and have gotten up, I believe, over a megajoule of energy into the laser-initiated um, in fusion experiments that they're working on. So. What they're working on here is this laser, uh, this uh, National Ignition Facility. So it's laser ignited fusion where they get a laser beam going, pew, 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 pulsing at like one billionth of a second, but it's super high energy and causing fusion to actually occur. Uh, here in the U.S., they have gotten past some of the hurdles that they were afraid of. So uh, it's uh, one of the fears is that plasma that's created during the process of, of heating up the atoms would get in the way of the laser beam and that uh, the, the atoms would no longer be able to absorb the energy of the laser once the plasma got in the way. But they've already showed that that's not a problem. They can keep on going and they are slowly building up to uh, what they hope to be uh, their, I guess, their fusion power of 1.2 megajoules. Um, like I said, now they've already gotten up past 1.0 megajoules. They have a top power possibility of 1.8 megajoules. Now, uh, NIF, they're already looking at the future and the idea of possibly being able to create fusion that can be sustained over long periods and possibly get out more energy than what's put in and be a potential power source for California. They're looking at that within the next 10 years. Now this, wow. yeah, it, it, they've, they've got some lofty goals, but I think that uh, based on everything that they're doing, they could very well reach them. Um, this ITER project now, it's just been, uh, it's a, an international project and they have just been having problems. It's a morass. Of, of issues with the budget, with the construction, and they just excitingly came to an agreement on the budget. They said, okay, the people from the different countries got together, the representatives, and they said, all right, we're over budget. What does this mean? And they agreed, they all agreed that yes, they could be over budget and that was okay. So let's create a new budget. <laughs> let's take money from other physics experiments to actually get this oh, project going. They better get it right. 
I know. I hope they get it right. I really do. The cost, um, they estimate the, this, this from the BBC. The delegates agreed that the overall costs of the project will be almost... Yeah, there's no there's no decimal point there. Twenty one billion dollars. That's about you know, the original uh, the original price. They estimated it yeah. was only going to be about seven billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, this is it's this is something that the first project in ten years may be able to power all of California. I mean, we we spent seven hundred and fifty billion dollars on banks that don't do anything except move money around and take a portion every time that they do. I think this, you know, twenty-one billion for science for something that could power the future of the world and uh, not have emissions. Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sign the check, somebody, please. <laughs> somebody. Seriously. That's what they're asking for, and so the delegates have also agreed they are going to send the checks. It's all gonna, it's all gonna work. Um, and they agreed on a timeline that is going to see the first experiments beginning. Hopefully, if construction actually gets underway and they actually finish it in 2019. And so they're hoping that the fusion reactor will actually create significantly more power than it uses to make the fusion happen by 2026 or 27. So uh, the ITER project uses a different kind of, uh, of an ignition system for the fusion reaction. So it's not the same kind of project as the National Ignition Facility that we have here. It's good. This, this one, the uh, ITER project, is international. So there's a lot of cooperation going on here. There's a lot that can be learned uh, just ab about getting fusion to work. Uh, and hope I'm just, my fingers are crossed that they make it work. Um, and then it'll be a race if, if they actually get it going. Who's going to actually create more power first? Is it going to be NIF? Is it going to be ITER? What's going on? Who's going to win? I don't know. Yeah. NIF is in the race early, so we'll see. Well, it all depends on who can avoid the morass. Ah, the morass. Yes. <laughs> what you got, Justin? A close look at ancient ass DNA has assisted researchers in sniffing out ancestors of the modern-day donkey and eliminated at least one ass assumed, to be, uh, ass assumed to be associated with the origination of the species. In the study, scientists traced the family trees of the domestic donkey using samples from live donkeys and Somali wild ass, as well as samples from the non-living African wild ass held in museums worldwide and isolated donkey bones from Egyptian archaeological digs. So this wide assortment of samples allowed the researchers uh, to tell their asses from a hole in the ground in Egypt where many of the remains were buried near the near the pharaohs. The result, sorting through the most comprehensive uh, sampling of mitochondrial DNA ever assembled from ancient historic and living specimens, scientists have determined this is this that the critically endangered African wild ass, which today exists only in a few uh, African zoos and wildlife reserves, is the living ancestor of the modern donkey. That's right. You have heard it here first, folks. The Somali wild ass has been unseated as the source of modern day donkeys. So this, this does leave a question for the remaining. Uh, there's a portion of the DNA that is in the more modern donkey that isn't associated with the African wild ass. And the Somalia wild ass has been actually found to be sort of a, a modern cousin of the donkey. So it may have gone through some domestication period early, but it wasn't, it's not the actual ancestor. It's another um, creation since the original one. So there's one that's missing that they think may be extinct and they're gonna keep looking for it that uh, hasn't been accounted for in this, uh, but the ancestors of the domestic donkey were considered vital for collecting water, moving the, the desert household around and creating the first land-based trade routes between ancient Egypt and the Sumerians. So if you really go back in time and look at this, this was it. This was before we had any other animal domesticated for, for labor. Uh, we had these, these donkeys. This was it. This was like the first steam engine, the first motor car, uh, the first airplane. These were... These are pretty huge. But what's also interesting is when they've gone back and detailed this, they found that this new technology wasn't, it wasn't the, what they'd originally assumed, which was it would be uh, kings who were putting together these groups of donkeys to do work for them. 
It was actually sort of the nomads who were living between the large industrial places that needed them uh, to survive. They needed them mm. for food, to move water and supplies around that desert to carry the water. Um, and it, so it was actually uh, sort of common folk who introduced the breeding and the use of the donkeys and then utilized that to do the, the trade between the kingdoms. So also interesting here is knowing where a domestication event first occurred is important. Because there are always cultural ramifications from being first, says Sandra Olson, PhD, curator of anthropology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. She wasn't part of this study, but she goes on that with the nucleus of animals that can serve as either a food source, transportation, or some other purpose, uh, particular cultures acquire advantages that make them more successful than their neighbors. And consider that animals like horse and donkey were also used for military purposes, <laughs> then uh, they become very important to a region. And so this looks like uh, they're talking about domestication of the donkey also occurring approximately 5,000 years ago, which, uh, yeah, you know. Isn't that about how long ago the, was it the, the, was it the, the cat or the dog was domesticated? Mm. I want to say one of those, I want to say one of those uh, animals was domesticated about well, the same time this period. Well, this is pharaohs. I think the cats were domesticated long before because it seems to me a lot of the ancient pharaohs had uh, statues of cats that looked as though they were, you know, small cats that were, looked like they were house pet type relations. And I think that goes back even thousands of years before this. Uh, cat uh, domestication, per, 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 modern day cat 10, was permanently domesticated 12, about 4,000 years ago oh. in Egypt. So oh. Oh. donkeys predated cats. Wow. There we go. Yeah, Interesting. Similar time period though. I guess, but this, is, this just seems like there's too many cats <laughs> in ancient Egypt <laughs> art for it to have been. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, know. earliest known evidence of a domesticated dog is a jawbone found in a cave in Iraq dated to about 12,000 years ago. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, although that, the, the dog always made more sense because we likely hunted the same prey. Um, we, we have similar mentalities. And in, in, we're, I mean, we're very similar to a dog in, in a lot of our behavior. Right. Um, Cats much just... more so than like to yeah. take advantage of us <laughs> yeah we're, they're a parasite basically that's what they are cats are cats are the domesticated parasite okay <laughs> okay oh look a cat and a donkey they get along great <sighs> oh my goodness i think i need to forget all of this Allie, <laughs> can you help me out <laughs> daydreaming uh, a new study was done that looked at the science of daydreaming and its effect on memory. And they found that they did studies to, to see um, like what the effect of different kinds of daydreaming would be on short-term memory. And they were looking at um, the way context matters. So if you, you know if you have a, a daydream about something similar to where you are, or what you're thinking about, um, they found that it inhibits your memory less. Um, they did this by they showed people a bunch of words on a screen and had them remember it or try to rem remember it. Um, or they showed them a bunch of words on a screen and then they had them either for the first test they had them think about um, think about their parents house where they or where they'd been that morning and then another group had to think about um, their home where they're living now. I guess they're college students so maybe they're college uh, their college home and the people that thought about their parents house had a lot more trouble remembering the words um, because it, it was a long lo a lot longer ago in time and then they did another test with space like placement and they found that they they did the same thing with the words and they had people think about a vacation they'd had and either in the US or um, abroad and the, the group that thought about abroad had a lot more trouble remembering the words on the screen. So they're, they're finding that it's kind of like where it is in your head. If you, if you think about something that's farther away or longer ago, your mind like actually kind of goes farther away and um, it's harder to remember, you know, where you are now or like what you're doing now and stuff. That's really interesting. Uh, one, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And one, one application they said of this, uh, one of the researchers says, um, 
if there's something you don't like, you don't feel like thinking about, you're better off remembering a more distant event than a close event. So to try to put your mind off it for a while, she says, it can help you feel like you're in a different situation. Um, yeah, and I just think it's really interesting too to think about how you know where all your memories are stored in your brain, and that if they're farther away, that you have to actually travel farther somewhere in your yeah. brain. I don't know. That the related that the related tangents that the the memory evokes have nothing to do with today. They might evoke a bunch of other distant memories. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, with the con the context that you were talking about, you know, is um, something we've we've talked about a little bit before. Is uh, if you have something happen in a particular environment, it's all those environmental cues. So, yeah. um, you know, like right now I'm sitting in this room, what's the temperature, uh, remembering you know, all the cameras around me, like who are the people here, what does it smell like, all of the, the context of memory. And so um, being here might help me remember things that happened here more easily, but then like not being here and being far away from it, um, it will be a little bit more difficult to remember. So if I'm at home on my couch, it's going to be a little bit harder for me to remember things that are here in the in the studio because the context is gone. The context is completely different. But this is like you're talking about things that are just further and further away, like actually physically further away. Like if I have to re if I wanted to forget something, it might be a good idea for me to think about my uh, my trip to Europe last fall. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, they were saying that too. They're, one of them was saying, so if your colleague comes in and asks, how, hey, how was your trip to Egypt a month ago? That's probably gonna, going to be far more disruptive as far as retrieving what you were just doing than if he interrupted your work to say deadlines in 30 minutes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the context, deadline, here, now, ah. Yeah, so it's such a bad idea. Such a good example. I feel like I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if he came in and said, "How was your morning?" or something. <laughs> <laughs> how was your morning? What did you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah. When you think about how it works, also it's um, where your attention is. So, what are you working on right now? What are you trying to remember? You have to think about attention as something that's a limited resource. And so if you, your attention is focused on the here and now and then somebody distracts you or you start, your mind starts wandering and your attention becomes less focused on the here and now but more focused on something else, say, was it this morning or was it something further and further away, like a donut. Yeah. donut. I think it's interesting, that too, how they do it as far as just space. Like, you know, because they said their second test was place. So if it was, you know, a trip in the U.S. versus a trip abroad but they didn't say you know the trip in the u.s was more recent or anything so it's just kind of interesting because it could be anywhere in the u.s it's still very different from whatever you were just thinking about but it's somehow in your mind it has that kind of spatial i don't know affiliation or something yeah and this does go along with uh, one of the stories that justin brought up I, I, months ago months ago about leaning forward and leaning back yeah. to like when you're thinking sure. of the future or something in the past and the, the way your body gets incorporated into it. So you know, it'd be interesting to, to have all of this information about how we remember stuff incorporated together into a, yeah. a general, then, then we'll know. Someone's leaning forward, someone's thinking of the past, you'll know what's happening. Uh, if you're In case you just tuned in, you are now watching or listening to This Week in Science. And um, did you know that infectious prions can uh, rise, uh, potentially, potentially arise spontaneously in even healthy brain tissue. This is kind of scary, but we don't know whether or not this is a, an absolute just yet. Thanks to Ed Dyer for sending this story in, by the way. A new study that was just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by some researchers at the Scripps Research Institute in Florida and the University College of London Institute of Neurology in England they uh, showed that prions, now prions are these proteins. They're little tiny proteins that have a healthy form and an infectious form. And they exist in every life form from yeast all the way to humans. You know, all across the, the animal kingdom, prions exist. And 
so we know that they're they're involved in some pretty basic functions of the nervous system or even just the cellular system within the with within different organisms but we don't know exactly what it does for what they do for sure but sometimes when they turn into the infectious form these good prions that are so important for everything they go bad dun 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 and uh, then you get things like scrapie mad cow disease creutzfeldt jacobs d- disease um that uh, and it's also known as atypical bovine spongiform encephalitis, where in neural tissue, if one of these infectious prions comes in contact with a healthy prion, it, it can actually turn a healthy prion into an infectious one. And so if a healthy cow in, or, or a sheep, this is what usually happens, tends to eat um, animal feed that has, uh, has neural tissue in it of... Um, of animals that maybe had scrapie or mad cow before then, they can potentially become infected and pass it on to other animals. And it's this wonderful chain, wonderful chain. But we don't know how it arises. Where does it come from? And these researchers put some cells in a dish. So this isn't necessarily an animal study, but they took healthy prion proteins and they put them in a dish with um, this special, with a, with, a, with a steel wire, because it seems they've found before that the infected prion proteins tend to accumulate around these metal wires. So they put healthy prion proteins around the metal wires, and oh my goodness, the healthy prion proteins suddenly seem to turn into infectious prion proteins, and they don't know where, how it happened, or where they came from. So the question now, based on this research, is did they really healthy prion proteins just spontaneously transform into the infectious form? And is that where the prion diseases come from? Or did uh, an unhealthy infectious prion protein exist at an undetectable level that they just didn't know they were there and putting them in the dish with the wire just happened to pull them out of the the healthy substrate so that they became more apparent? That's the question. We don't know, but if it if prions become infectious spontaneously, I mean that could mean that at any point in time, any prion anywhere could potentially spontaneously become infectious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like spontaneous zombie formation. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't have enough to worry about, uh, you'd start uh, unfolding proteins in your brain just out yeah. of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yay, prions. I love, I, I think prions are totally fascinating, but they're a little bit, uh, yeah, they're a little bit scary. A little bit scary. You don't want to eat prion infected infected animals. That's bad. That's bad. But, um, you know, you don't want to, I don't know. I, you're right. We probably don't. <laughs> yeah, we There's prob- probably no good that can come of it. There's probably not an upside. I should stop. <laughs> yeah, just just stop. Just, just so much cheaper, you know. <laughs> the down cows, the down right. cows always, their meat is always so much cheaper, and a, and and a little more tender. <laughs> well, if that's an issue, that's an issue. Tell me, tell me what you. Uh, I, I want to know about. Uh, Do you want to know about the mind of God? Yes, Kirsten? yes, I want to know. Can yes. I tell you about the mind of God, Kirsten? Yes, please. Can I get a hallelujah and amen? Uh, a hell yeah. Uh, Probably not. Maybe not. The mind of God, <laughs> often painted with, with much certainty from Sunday pulpits and evangelical broadcasts, may have been discovered recently by neurosurgery researchers at John Hopkins. Wow, wow. that's cool. Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, uh, from Michelangelo's painting, Separation of Light from Darkness. So if you're uh, listening, watching live, you should go open a window and Google the separation of light from darkness. It is the depiction of God's neck in the painting that has uh, for some time been an object of curiosity because it looks kind of lumpy. His beard looks like it doesn't go all the way under his, uh, under his chin. And for a long time, they've been trying to kind of figure out why Michelangelo, who was completely adept at uh, mimicking human anatomy in his paintings and his artwork and his sculptors. 
and sculpt, uh, sculpture. Uh, for some reason, in this this one neck, uh, it seems not quite the fit. Seems like a bit of an oddity. So the resemblance here, uh, they're saying, it is bearing a striking resemblance to a brainstem, as seen in a cadaver, and is outlined in the painting from the perspective of one who is performing an autopsy on a cadaver. So huh. Michelangelo, Michelangelo was not only a 16th century master painter sculptor, he was actually also a very accomplished autonomist and had documented lots of parts of the anatomy with his artwork. It's actually where he it is attributed much to his, of his ability to paint the human figures attributed to the fact that from uh, his teenage years on he was able to be involved in, in these autopsies so that he really knew better than almost anybody else at the time how bodies are put together. So this is it's very interesting. This is on the uh, depiction. This depiction of God is in the, the roof of the Sistine Chapel or the ceiling. Excuse me. If it was on the roof, nobody could see it. You'd have to climb up. Climb up on the roof. Look down. I'm standing the, on it. <laughs> The findings uh, were by a neurosurgeon and a medical illustrator and are published in the May Neurosurgery, uh, or, uh, the, uh, published in, yeah, in the, the journal Neurosurgery. And it may explain this long controversial, controversial uh, unusual feature on um, this fresco figure. Michelangelo is, uh, wow, he, he's done a lot of these paintings. This actually wouldn't be the first time that an anatomical uh, sort of feature of the brain, in fact, was found in one of his paintings. There's the, I think it's the, is it the birth of Adam? Or the creation of Adam. It's another one. Um, and you go, go, uh, go Google the, I think it's the creation of Adam. You go take a look at that one. That's the one where it's a very famous God is reaching out with the finger and he's sort of got his flowing robes around right. him. Yeah. And, you know, the angels are all there huddled around him within his robe. If you look at that painting, the outline that the robes flowing make is almost identical to a human brain. To a brain. And there's I even like a I just saw that. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and what's really interesting about, I mean, this doesn't, this is something that nobody, nobody who was hiring Michelangelo to paint the roof of the Sistine Chapel would have seen him making these these sort of juxtaposes of God and the human brain. And it may maybe maybe I mean, this isn't in this story at all. They're just they're just these are just uh, neurosurgeons who looked at it and could kind of identify it when they saw it. They were like, well, gosh, I think I've seen this before. And they went and started doing a study on it. Also in uh, separation of light and darkness, they later looked at the, that one portion that looks like a brainstem. God's also wearing this robe that has a sort of tubular feature that seems to descend from the bottom of the uh, that brain stem all the way down his torso. And in that one, they're, they're, the rest of the paintings that have that robe, that sort of tubular feature isn't there. But it's interesting because it lines up very much and is about the same shape and size and placement of a spinal cord. So it could actually be the brain stem and a spinal cord in the separation of light from darkness. Um, if you look closely uh, also at the uh, creation of Adam. Um, this is going to open up like a whole new area of um, artistic analysis for graduate students. You know? <laughs> this is great. I love it. Yeah, and the creation of Adam, it's, it's, it, the outline is very much like the brain. Um, you could sort of, I don't know if somebody has gone, you could go deeper into it and see if the, the number of angels there can sort of represent different lobes. Um, it definitely has a sort of brain stemmy uh, feature at the bottom of it. But this is something that, you know, when painting for his re religious higher ups, you know, the contractor to do a Sistine Chapel roof, they would have no idea that these hidden illusions were made in there to the mind of uh, to God having the having a human brain. I think it's really fascinating. Do you know? Do you know what Michelangelo's like, philosophy was, or anything, as far as that stuff is concerned? Is there any? I mean, I don't know. But do you know anything about that? I don't, and I'm I'm gonna have to do some reading. Yeah. I'm gonna have to do some searching. Um. I think it's. I think it would be for somebody who had an, analyzed the human body so 
so deeply as, mm-hmm. as far as doing autopsies and sort of capturing the essence of, of a human body in a way that almost nobody was even really truly aware of at the, at the you know, this is 16th century. Mm-hmm. They didn't have education or illustrations about what was going on in the human body that he may, he may have had ideas about uh, humanity that differed from the churches. I, I, you know, I don't really know. Yeah, who's to tell about something like that? Um, we are at about the time that we should take a break. I just wanted to go very quickly to uh, a really quick headline for this week in world robot domination. Uh, short order cooks, you better beware for your jobs. The pancake flipping robots are out there, <sighs> out to mm-hmm. get you. Yeah, um, in case you in case you were not aware, we have a, uh, uh, some researchers who have actually taught a, uh, a robot to flip pancakes. Although uh, there is a video available online. If you go to TWIWRD, T-W-I-W-R-D, This Week in World Robot Domination, all the first letters, .blogspot.com, you can see the see the the demonstration where the scientist helps him out, then the robot has a few trouble trials of its own, and eventually hmm. gets it. Perfect flipped pancakes by robots. <laughs> I'm seeing I'm seeing the line the line cooks. It's all just robot arms flipping pancakes in the future. <sighs> no job is safe in the in the coming <laughs> domination. <sighs> A robot mom. That's what we really need now, isn't it? The robot mom, the robot babysitter, the stay-at-home robot. Rosie. Yeah, from the Jetsons. Rosie. I except, know. Except, except the Jetsons was great because mom still didn't work. Mom yeah. still got to be a stay-at-home mom and had a robot doing all her work for her. Mm, I gotta work on that. I gotta figure that one out. Huh. She- she had it going on, that Mrs. Jetson. Well, I think in the future we did we do figure out that any economy will will run better with fewer people vying for the jobs, and we'll go back to the uh, one income household. Maybe. We could solve we could solve unemployment right now. Right now, <laughs> just made it you know like the law that everybody if any, everybody any live can, alone and one income household. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, no, you don't have to live alone. You just have one income household. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be the women that don't work. It could be the men. I think we deserve that shot. Actually, I mean, I think it's about time we've worked for the past tens of thousands of years doing all the. And on, uh, you know, and on so, that thought, I think it's time to go to the break. Go to work and, uh, yeah, let's take the know, break and let everyone ponder your thoughts. Pull fifty percent of the workers out of the workplace and uh, what? <laughs> to do for a promo. Hey, listen to twists. Something like that. Something like that. Does anyone in the chat room have an idea? Have an idea? Uh, yes, Jeff Coffey. Other than KDVS, there are multiples out there. I should list them on the website. That would be nice. It would be good to do that. 
Mm, science! That's right. Science, all caps. It's science! That's right. Listen to This Week in Science, your weekly dose of informative yet entertaining science news with Dr. Kiki and Justin Jackson. This is good. It's supposed to only be like 30 seconds. I don't know. <laughs> Watch our show, aren't you there? <laughs> I like this one too. I like this one. I'm Dr. Kiki from This Week in Science, otherwise known as Twist. Watch our show. It's good for you. And uh, if you don't, maybe our evil death rays will explode you. Or not. But you won't know unless you listen or don't. This Week in Science is your weekly dose of science news in an entertaining, irreverent format. Come on, join on in. You'll like it. There we go. I will play with it. I will play with it later. I might just record something at home. Where is Justin? Is he back yet? His half hour, his half hour runaway routine is getting old. Like a plane and hollow ones put up. Building up my tolerance and I wanna have a bunch of on steak. Dance down in the gamma rays. I'm gonna mute all this chemical jive. So my progeny will survive in this unnatural toxic juice. So they will thrive and reproduce. I'm gonna pay my DNA. And we're back. This is This Week in Science. Awesome blues song. I know. One of the great songs off of the 2010 Science Music Compilation. That I Which think is I'm... still available. Yeah, because I haven't actually made it available yet. I was uh, oh. making sure that everyone who donated to the KDBS fundraiser got theirs first. You know, that was the whole thing. It's put out for the fundraiser, so if people donated to the fundraiser and got the uh, the CD as their premium gift from us. And I just wanted to make sure that the, the first comers, that they would get it first. And now I'm actually, I think I'm going to start sending them out. I think I'm going to make them available, available pretty soon. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when you can get your hands on the music. On the music, I will. Um, Justin, I think I yeah. am getting a headache. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, what do I do, Doc? This uh, eat a sea snail. <laughs> That's all I got. Oh, okay, story. great. Now this is a uh, this is kind of a this is a fun story. This is more us learning stuff that nature already had figured out someplace over the uh, billions of years of evolution on the planet. Uh, sea snails are, as we all are probably aware, are not the fastest predators. Uh, out there. So for them to get a meal of a fish, uh, the marine cone snails have evolved an arsenal of chemical weapons. Yeah, the cone snails, they have some crazy poison. Yeah, they do. They they've, usually... been, they've been like investigating cone snails for a while now about painkillers and stuff. Right, they use a deadly dose of uh, conotoxins, which are peptide toxins that disrupt a myriad of biological functions that they inject into passing prey with a hypodermic needle-like tooth that their hypodermal uh, teeth, actually, that shoot from their mouths like harpoons. <laughs> Ow! Wow. That's some evolutionary I spear you right with there. my poison tooth spear! Yeah, that's awesome. So within this conotoxin brew are several peptides that uh, relieve tough-to-treat neuropathic pain just as well as morphine does, and it's suspected that they do so without the addictive uh, side effect properties, which I don't know. I think morphine does mimic uh, what goes on in the brain so much that perhaps that's why it becomes addictive easily. I don't know. Right. I'm not sure that they could really state that a painkiller that works just as well as morphine won't become addictive. Like, I, I don't know. Uh... It depends on what's driving the addiction. Well, it's the, hey, I'm addicted to not feeling pain. 
Yeah. Or the, <laughs> hey, you know, that's great. <laughs> I mean, that's almost like saying that the pleasure center of the brain is it not involved with addiction, which I don't really think is true, but is stated in this article, so we'll go with it for now. Yeah. Uh, scientists have tried to turn such compounds into pain relievers in the past, and they've been ham hamstrung with problems in administering. Yikes. So. Uh, the, I guess the problem is involved in uh, revolves around using peptides in in, meta, in in medicine. I guess they're not very stable. The molecules that are there break down or they don't function properly. One of the only ones right. that uh, is known out there to, to work is Pryalt, but uh, needs to be injected directly into the spinal cord. Ouch! A surgically implanted pump. So it's not the most convenient. Mm -hmm. Albeit, no matter how effective it is, if you have to do a spinal tap to uh, have it administered, it's not going to be something that you're going to get over the counter. You better, you better darn well be getting rid of your pain if you're getting a, a spinal tap pump, mm -hmm. you know, inserted in, you know, implanted into yourself. I mean, yeah. that, that it, you'd better be on, number one under some terrible, terrible pain, and then number two, this better get rid of it <laughs> if you're going to go through that kind of procedure. Uh, so, okay, so yeah. scientists in Australia now have managed to engineer a conotoxin that can be taken orally. This uh, research is led by David J. Craig, Institute of Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland. And he has discovered that by linking N-terminus of a conotoxin, VEL1, a compound derived from Conus victoriae, to its C-terminus, they could make a 16 residual peptide orally active. So anyways, they cyclized, uh, cyclized this peptide. They did some magic science-y stuff to it. So the protein's head and tail are then tethered uh, by a string of amino acids. And this actually keeps it, uh, basically it keeps it more stable for longer. And they're testing in rats and it seems to be a potent painkiller for rats. So yet another medical breakthrough if you're a rat. Yeah, um, <laughs> I want to be a rat. <laughs> I mean, we're going to solve all of rats' problems by the end mice, of the day. Mice, rats, yeah, they got it Longevity, covered. every disease, they'll take a pill, they won't have to exercise, they'll stay thin. The rats are going to be, rats and mice are going to absolutely dominate the earth with the plethora of pharmaceuticals they have at their disposal. Yeah, pretty much, pretty so much. Next, next step, though, is, of course, to see if it can... Uh, in fact, be taken orally by humans and have the same effect. They're looking at funds to finalize this research. Um, but if that'd be awesome, if successful, this could actually replace a, uh, a myriad of pharmaceuticals for pain that are currently out there and hopefully be non addictive. I still doubt that there won't be an addictive or at least recreational, you know, desire for something like this. Yeah, the, the, the hope is that it is that it, this could be used to get rid of pain, but isn't something that turns out to uh, be more damaging to people in terms of right. the addictive nature. Yeah. But, but it looks first like, things first, know, let's see if it works in people. First things first. Right. And this idea though of, uh, it's called cyclization where the peptide is sort of chained to its tail and, and becomes more stable, uh, has been found in nature before. So the, the research that they've been doing to try to make it um, stable They've actually found before, they, they note the discovery of uh, a peptide Calada B1, which was discovered in the 70s by Lawrence Grand, a Norwegian doctor who was working in the Congo region of Africa. Okay. Grand noticed that the local women drank a certain tea when they were about to give birth and it seemed to shorten the labor time. Mm -hmm. He identified the protein from the native plant used to make the tea uh, that was uh, responsible and found that this connection was, was there that made it stable enough to be turned into a tea and then and then used for the uh, for the birthing process. Ah, that's interesting. I love that. Taking taking uh, information learned from tribal culture, adding it to things that we've found in nature and being able to hopefully create something that can really be of benefit to people. Fingers crossed on this. That's an awesome story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Australia. Know, just in, yeah, just in time for um, everyone to live longer with all the, all the rats and mice to live longer at least and people to have less pain uh, it's time for this week in the end of the world so uh, according to researchers publishing in nature this week uh, phytoplankton which are at the bottom of the food web uh, 
primary producers, very important for food for just about everything in the entire world, have been dropping in their abundance for the last century. And most of that drop has been since about 1950, which, hey, hmm, coincides with a lot of increases in temperature and carbon dioxide levels, but I didn't say that. Um, and it's been about a 40% drop in phytoplankton over the last 60 years or so. Kind of worrisome. We should uh, t keep an eye on that. It's something that researchers are a little worried about. Additionally, uh, 2010 is on track to be the hottest year. And um, more data coming in from the National Ocean... Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Office and the UK's Met Office with their annual State of the Climate Report saying that, hey, data confirms that from the year 2000 or since the year 2000, it's been the hottest decade ever. Wow. Ever. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. But, you know, we don't have to worry about all this. I mean, people are worrying about the climate change. They're worrying about the the, the temperatures and the carbon dioxide levels. And uh, what are we going to do? Wait, solutions? We have to come up with solutions? No, we don't have to come up with solutions. All we have to do, you know, if we stick around... The Earth might end up not being here in about uh, a little over 100, almost 200 years. So 2182 is on track to be the year that we get hit by an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if it's not That's climate amazing. change, I know. Whew, ah, yay. <laughs> if it's not climate change, then, you know, potentially hazardous asteroids are on track to hit us. So, um, <laughs> yeah, what do you choose? <laughs> You choose your poison. I don't know. Well, which you know, it's what, 2188? 2182. Yes, 2182. 20 okay, that gives me a little less time to plan. Um, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, get it together. <laughs> Make it snappy. <laughs> yeah, I, being mortal uh, at this point, um, not too concerned with that far down the road. I don't think that far ahead. Um but uh, if science does give us the everlasting life that allows us to see that day, at that point, it may be a welcome change. <laughs> I mean, Very well. If I'm, if I'm around for the next uh, 1,700 and something years, whatever it is, I, uh, I'm probably, I've probably seen it all, done it all at that point, and I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to move on. Yeah, well, maybe we can, like, hop a ride on one of the next asteroids to go around and... Uh get out of this joint go go find someplace else the uh, the asteroid story is kind of interesting researchers looked at the at the route that the that this asteroid which is known as uh 1999 RQ36 and there's another number with a bunch of with parentheses around it it's just too too long of a name asteroid parentheses 101955 and parentheses 1999 RQ36 yes it's part of the potentially hazardous asteroids database, and it has a possibility of hitting the Earth due to the closeness of the orbit and possibility of causing damage. It was discovered in 1999, and they think it's about uh, 560 or so meters in diameter. Um, its orbit is fairly well figured out. Thank goodness. Uh, so researchers took a look at that and they said, hey, the total impact probability can be estimated at approximately one in a thousand chance. But over half of this chance corresponds to the year 2182. And um, they also say we have the potential until about 2060 that to actually do something about it after 2060 they say divergence of the impacting orbits is moderate between 2060 and 2080 it increases four orders of magnitude because the asteroid approaches the earth in those years and then it increases again until about 2162 and then decreases and then whatever um but this complex dynamic is not just the likelihood of a comparatively large impact but also that a realistic deflection procedure, also known as a path deviation, could only be made before the impact in 2080 and more easily before 2060. So 
we have these other probabilities of potential impacts. When do we want to actually, do we want to, do we want to, you know, go out and try and stop the asteroid? Deflect it? I don't know. Or maybe we should just say, Psh, give up the ghost. Forget about it. This place is too hard. <laughs> Well, and besides, trying to blow up asteroids is like trying to pee in the wind. <laughs> yeah. you, you just Maybe. don't know what the results are going to be, but hmm. chances are it's going to end badly. Yeah, at some point. At some point. Well, especially because so many of those asteroids we're finding are just huge conglomerations of gravel. We may take that dodgeable bullet and turn it into a shotgun blast. It <laughs> just rains tear across the globe instead of just solidly missing or <laughs> slightly impacting some portion of the overall earth yeah hey Allie, are pigs optimistic about this <laughs> well uh i guess it depends on where they live um yeah are pigs optimistic or pessimistic um something i don't think most people have thought about but Catherine Douglas did, and she found a way, she and her team found a way to ask pigs if they're feeling optimistic or pessimistic about life. Um, and she did it based on the way, on the way that they live. Um, so she had a, she had a bunch of pigs and she basically taught them to associate um, a sound with it, with a, a response, kind of like Pavlov dogs um so one one thing they were taught to associate a note on a glockenspiel with an apple a treat of an apple and then also a dog they heard a dog training clicker and they were they associated that with something unpleasant which was like a ruffling plastic bag so they had those associations and then in the next step of the experiment she placed half of those pigs in in a, an enriched environment which had like lots of space and freedom to roam around and straw to play in and pig toys and then the other half were placed in a smaller more boring environment with no straw and only one non-interactive toy um and then and then what they did was they played an, an ambiguous sound which they hadn't learned anything about a squeak and they saw how each each set of pigs responded and she said that the results were compelling she found that um we found that almost without exception the pigs in the enriched environment were optimistic about what this new noise could mean and approached expecting to get the treat in contrast the pigs in the boring environment were pessimistic about this new strange noise and fearing it might be the mildly unpleasant plastic bag did not approach for a treat that's um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and she says it's a see, we see all the time in human being or in humans where how we are feeling affects our judgment of, of ambiguous event, events. For example, if you're having a bad day, feeling stressed or low, and you're and um, you're presented with an ambiguous cue such as your boss calling you into their office, the first thing that goes through your head is what have I done wrong? And we, co we call this a negative co cognitive bias. But on a good day, you greet the same ambiguous event far more positively. You might strut in expecting a slap on the back and a pay raise. So, yeah. <laughs> and it's really interesting because it shows that pigs have this, like, complex emotional ability to, you know, get pessimistic or optimistic and... Yeah, and, yeah, and, and really actually too, respond to ambiguous situations. That's just yeah. yeah this is definitely. this is the secret that uh, that thing that uh, started someplace in the '70s, and there have been books and many reads. Oh, the, of this the secret. The secret, right. you know, uh -huh. and yeah. and it really does come down to basically being optimistic and positive thinking, and and assuming good things will happen. And it's funny I, I, because if you take this, I'm gonna whole, get an apple. I'm gonna get an <laughs> apple. <laughs> take this whole yeah. pig thing. <laughs> and apply it to our daily life. I bet. I, I bet it. Uh, I bet it pans out to any any day in the life of it being a human being. How the how the day's gone so far sets you up to how you react to the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. that's awesome. So let's all take a lesson from the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that story. And we are heading to the end of our hour. Uh, I just wanted to run through a couple of bits and odds and ends. The dunk. This story was sent in by uh, Gordon McLeod, and uh, a very rare donkey zebra hybrid has been welcomed into the world in Georgia. Officials at the oh. 
Chestati Wildlife Preserve uh, are very surprised at this cute little zedonk. Um, like any hybrid, it is sterile, or so they think. It should be sterile. Um, but it has some wild behaviors uh, similar to zebras. So instead of lying mm. down and relaxing in, on the grass like it's a donkey, uh, one of its donkey parents, it stands around like it's going, it's looking for predators more like it's zebra dad. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's cute little Zidon. That's a, that's a cool ass story. <laughs> that it was. <laughs> now, uh, Australians, I know that you've always wanted to know the origin of the kangaroo. You claim the roo. You claim the origin of the marsupials, oh Australia. But, and this is uh, this 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 pun. I did not come up with it. It's actually in the article. Uh, researchers looked at jumping genes in the genome to actually determine that marsupials, like the kangaroo, originated in uh, South America. Ancient roots in South America rather than Australia. So sorry, Australia. You're out. You're out. Um, and I guess that, that's about it for today. We had a bunch I got, of I got one stuff. last. Yeah? I got one. Do we have time for just this last one? It's Quick and blurb it. This, Quick and blurb it. this piece of paper has been just used for no reason. Uh, <laughs> just as cooking helps people digest food, cooking waste for fungi taste is uh, leading the way to the removal of bisphenol A from our dumps around the world. So they uh, pre-treated uh, polycarbonate plastic, the source of bisphenol A, so that it, uh, it may be, the, and this may now be the key to actually disposing it on a larger scale. Mukish Doble, Trishul Aram note that the manufacturers, that manufacturers produce about 2.7 million tons of plastic containing BPA each year. That's a, uh, it's used in everything, my goodness. Screwdriver handles, eyeglasses, DVDs, it's a thing that they're pulling out of all the bottled water because if it heats up, the BPAs leak in, can have all sorts of es synthetic estrogen-like uh, effects on the human human system. Bad. And all they had to do was pre-treat the uh, to pre-treat this uh, polycarbonate was use some ultraviolet light and heat, and then exposed it to different kinds of fungi, the including this uh, one of the fabled white rot fungus, which is used commercially for environmental. Uh, remediation cleanups of really tough pollutants. So what they found, though, was that the fungi grew better on this heated ultraviolet light exposed plastic and using its BPA and other ingredients as a source of energy, the the fungi broke it down. They broke it down after 12 months or one year. There was almost no decomposition of the untreated plastics compared to the substantial decomp uh, decomposition of the pre-treated plastic with no release of BPA. So... Cool. Fungi to the rescue once again in Woot. human ways. Right on. We love, love those. The fungi. We do. We do. And uh, that's, a, that's a wrap. I think we're done with the show for today. On next week's show, more science news. I'd like to shout out to everyone who wrote in over the last week. I uh, enjoyed all your stories. Thanks so much to uh, Michael Lauzon. I got to get to your... He, Michael sent in a song for us. Um but I ran out of storage on uh, Libsyn, our, our server. Uh, and so I have to wait until next week so I can actually upload it and play it for you guys. Um, Monkey, Gordon McLeod, David Eckerd, Paul, Dark Passenger 2. He found some more stuff. Ed Dyer, as always, thanks for all of your stories. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for writing in. If you have any uh, comments, we do enjoy them. Yes, we do enjoy your comments. Uh, you can uh, contact us at uh, Dr. Kiki on the Twitter or at Jackson Fly. We're both on there. I've got a, a Facebook page, which is in my name, Justin Jackson, on the Facebook Internet. You can go do that. And Kirsten, uh, Kirsten has a Facebook page, too, but you can't uh, be her friend. You can be her fan, though. She has a fan site. You can That's be right. her fan. You're my fan, but, but not my but friend, you can, unless you you're really be, my friend. And then you can be my friend. But you're all really my friends at any time. Oh, so go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Me up. That's uh, right. You can also email Kirsten at this uh, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Uh, and be sure to put twists somewhere in the subject or you will be spam filtered into oblivion. 
Yeah, and that's no good place. No good no. place at all. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We hope you have enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. So go to our website, twist.org, where you can find show notes. We do put show notes up. And, yes, I will add links to the show notes as well. Uh, eventually, you should be able to subscribe from there, too. But I haven't gotten that in there yet. For information on uh, how to subscribe or just to subscribe, go to iTunes or any other um, podcast directory. And you can find us there you can also get Google twists us in the itunes yeah <laughs> you can also get twists on your android phone look for twists for droid in robo the android twist. marketplace robo twist that's right and we'll be back next week we will we hope that you'll join us again for more great sciencey goodness and news and if you've learned anything from today's show remember it's all in your head I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough of